I'm Megan, and I'm here with Andy Weir to chat all things Project Hail Mary. I'm Andy Weir, and I'm here with Megan to chat all things Project Hail Mary. (laughs) Why does being trapped in space intrigue you? It's nice to have like a person versus nature kind of competition. And like, I really like that plot contrivance, I guess, because nobody roots for nature in a person versus nature story. Your, Mm. Your loyalties are not divided. When I'm watching like a person, watching a reading, whatever, a person versus person story, I'm kind of like rooting for the bad guy a little bit because I know in the end he's going to lose. And so I kind of feel bad for him. I want him to get his licks in now, you know, stuff like that. But nobody roots for nature. So everybody's on board with the protagonist. Where do you start your novels and how do you go from idea to finished book? Well, the general ideas generally come from daydreaming. And it's never like, oh, you know, an epiphany. It's like I have kind of part of an idea, then I store it in the back of my head. Then later on, I have an unrelated idea. And I'm like, oh, I could glue these two together. And like Project Hail Mary, for instance, is is the result of like five or six completely unrelated separate book ideas Mm. I had that I put together. Like I had one idea for, oh, uh, an astronaut who wakes up in a spaceship with amnesia. Okay. Another one was, oh, um, a uh, mass conversion-based fuel. Okay. Another one was like, oh, a first contact story. You know. And another one was like, oh, what, what if like a person was given complete, utter authority over everything in the world to solve a critical problem? <laughs> and so that was another one. And so uh, Project Hail Mary is basically a collection of ideas that I had had bouncing around in my head that kind of fit together well. And then I sanded off the edges. And how do you sand off the edges with so many disparate ideas? <laughs> well, they fit together well. It wasn't like, oh, here are the ideas I need to cram them together. Mm. It was like, okay, I'm starting to develop an idea for a plot. Oh, you know what would slot in well here is that one idea I had earlier about this. And, mm. ooh, I could put this in there and that would fit. And it's more like a jigsaw puzzle. So your main character wakes up in space with no memory, mm-hmm. as you mentioned. Uh, that sounds like a nightmare. Did you set out to create the most terrifying <laughs> idea ever in space? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the mo- there are much more terrifying things that can happen <laughs> to you, but he wakes up with amnesia and I mean, it's such a trope, right? Like, you know, starting a story with a guy waking up with amnesia. Okay, <laughs> that's been done just 10,000 times or something. And I freely admit it was just a cheap way for me to tell the story in a way that kept the plot moving along interestingly um, with the with the flashbacks. Mm. So basically, like I wanted to tell the story of like Ryland on the ship and everything that happens beyond there. But there's a lot of setup that caused that to happen. All the stuff on Earth, all the discoveries, all the things like that. But if I told the story linearly, it would be really unsatisfying. You'd have all the stuff that takes place on Earth, then the Hail Mary leaves, and then you never see the Earthside characters again ever. Mm-hmm. And so it would be like, it would almost be like that was all a prologue to a different book and it would be really unsatisfying. So I definitely wanted to do it interspersed with flashbacks. Now the amnesia plot device, uh, it's almost like a framing device. It lets me tell the flashbacks in a way that they kind of come, they I, hopefully to the reader, they seem natural. Like mm. he gets a flash of memory from the past mm-hmm. And I am the 7,931st author to come up with this. But that was, I think, the best way to tell this story. Incredible. So I did. So an extraterrestrial character communicates through music. Mm-hmm. How did you come up with that idea? Is music an important form of communication to you? For, for that species, the Iridians, I, I built up the entire biosphere of Arid in my mind of, okay, we start out. So that planet is a real exoplanet. It actually exists. Wow. Yeah. And it, just because we're now able to find planets on other stars is really cool. I love the future. It's <laughs> awesome. And so that's a real exoplanet that I chose to be his um, the homeworld. And then I started, uh, I, I took all the information that we know about that exoplanet and said, okay, that's set in stone. That's, that's canon. Anything that we don't know, I could just make up. So we know its mass. We know how far it is from its star. We know how long it takes to orbit its star, stuff like that. But we don't know its composition. We don't know if it's a rocky planet like Earth or a gas giant. We don't know any of that. Mm. So I got to make all that up. I said, okay, it has about the same density as Earth. And to have this mass at that same density, what's its diameter? Okay, it's this big. Um, It's really close to the star. I want there to be liquid water on the surface, but it would be really, really, really hot on the surface. So how do I keep the water from boiling away? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is a really, really high pressure keeps water from boiling. (laughs) Okay, so they have a really high atmospheric pressure. And then I'm like, how do they have such a thick atmosphere when they're so close to their star? Because the star acts, acts like acts like a sandblaster. 
And I'm like, well, the way Earth did it was by having a strong magnetic field. So these guys have a way strong magnetic field. In order to have a way strong magnetic field, you have to be spinning really fast. The mm. planet has to be spinning fast. So it has an orbit a rotation period of six six hours. So then I had the environment. Okay, now I've created an environment on this exoplanet where you have liquid water. Then I'm like, what evolves there? I'm like, well, the atmosphere is so thick that light doesn't reach the surface. Mm. So there's no need to evolve vision because there's no benefit to it. Okay. How, how would how would you get a sense of your three-dimensional environment if you cannot evolve vision? Mm. And I thought the obvious answer is echolocation, sound. And so these creatures are very, very good at sound and getting a feel for their environment with sound, the built-in sonar, all that stuff like that. And I'm like, if they're so good with sound, then the obvious way for their language to work is via sound. So that's why, like humans, they use sound for communication. And then I'm like, okay, well, what would they sound like? And I'd already designed their biology is they're almost like a self-contained biosphere. They don't exchange gases with the air via lungs. They have like cooling that kind of goes across the top, but they don't have lungs that they breathe in and then can expel the air. Mm. So they wouldn't have vocal cords. I'm like, well, how do you make sounds if you're not exchanging air with the environment? And the answer has been solved a long time ago by whales. Mm. Whales make sounds without expelling air. They, they just kind of move air back and forth across their vocal cords. Mm. I'm like, okay, so that's what they do. So the end result is they make musical notes. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I decided they have like five of those little sound bladders around their body so they can make chords. <laughs> and then a chord is a word and then they have a language. And just like any other, just like any other world, they have lots of different cultures. So they have lots of different languages and they're just one part of an entire biosphere. So that was like a way longer answer than you wanted, <laughs> but that's what editing is for. <laughs> no, it's <was> fascinating. <laughs> I am so on board. Uh, it leads very well into my next question, which is, how do you balance the narrative intrigue and being scientifically accurate? Well, for me, the scientific accuracy almost always takes priority. Mm. Like if I come up with a cool idea, but it's not supported by the, by the science, mm -hmm. then I've got to ditch the idea or modify it. And so one of the most important things is whatever, whatever you're writing, whether it's a fantasy story or a science fiction story, whenever you're, when it, if it's not something that, that could drop into the real world, like a drama or a romance or something like that, then you're going to have some rules hmm. that you've come up with. You know, they might violate the actual rules of physics, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, like, I have no problem watching Star Trek. They've got warp drive, they, you know, whatever. That's fine. You've come up with the rules of the universe that your story takes place in. You have to follow those rules. Hmm. Or the reader will go like, wait, what about, what about this? What about that? What about mm -hmm. that? So, I mean, one of my biggest gripes watching the classic Star Trek series is their ship can go many, many times the speed of light. But it, in one episode, they were going from the planet Mercury to the planet Earth, and it was like taking them a while. I'm like, <laughs> Mercury is like seven light minutes away from Earth. If you're going like 20 times the speed of light, it should be a matter of seconds for you to get from Mercury to Earth. So like, what the hell, Gene Roddenberry, who's already dead by the time I'm making this observation. So, um, but yeah, so you have to follow the rules. So I, I set up my fake rules. Mm. I did try to keep to real science. You have to actually dig quite a ways deep into Project Hail Mary before you find the place where I'm actually breaking real physics. Mm. And it's all the way down at the quantum level. It's <laughs> the way the astrophage cell membrane works. It can hold neutrinos in. And as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. um, neutrinos uh, pass through matter pretty much effortlessly. They're, it's very, very hard to make a neutrino collide with anything. Uh, it tends to just quantum tunnel right on through everything. But an astrophage cell membrane has super cross-sectionality, a term I invented, which <laughs> means that even neutrinos can't get out. They bounce around like air molecules inside. And that is BS. There's <laughs> really no way for that to happen. But I feel good if you have to if you have to go all the way down to the quantum level to find the 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 BS physics that I threw in there. Yeah, I think that's a good benchmark. All the I way down there. Good. Yeah. You have to be way down there. <laughs> I've never had I've never had like new scientific knowledge show up while I'm in the middle of writing something and I had to change it. I have had, you know, cases where I published something and then new scientific knowledge came up that kind of invalidated it. Mm. So like, for instance, in The Martian, he goes through an enormous amount of effort to make water for his crops. He, he does a bunch of chemistry with his leftover rocket fuel. He kind of blows himself up a little bit. It's all very dangerous and very difficult. But because he was in like, a, you know, there's, there's at the time I wrote it, it was believed that there was like 
no water at all to be had, like on the surface of Mars, maybe some at the poles, that's it. And then after the book published, um, the uh, Curiosity rover landed, took mm. up a scoop of dirt and said like, hey guys, look, there's a shitload of water in here. <laughs> wow, look at all this water. <laughs> Turns out there's like, if you just go to Mars and grab like a cubic meter of soil, there's about 35 liters of water in there. So if you filled up a, f a refrigerator, about two cubic meters worth of volume, if you filled up your refrigerator with uh, Martian regolith dirt, and then extracted all the water out of it, you would have 35 two liter bottles full of water. So all Marsh, and, all Marsh, all Mark had to do was bring in some dirt and heat it up and the water <laughs> would come out. But so I, you know, live and learn. Mm. And then, and then, you know, but at the time, the predominant theories on what Mars was like was that it was completely dry. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I can still get away with it because I say, well, just like on Earth, we have the Sahara Desert and we have the Amazon rainforest. We have different biomes, different weather patterns in different parts of the planet. Mm. And the Martian takes place in Acidalia Planitia, where we have never sent a probe. So for all you know, it could be a barren desert wasteland <laughs> that doesn't have any water in the sand. And no one can prove me wrong until you send a probe. Mm -hmm. Speaking of probes, side story. I describe in great detail um, in the Martian where where the Ares 3 landing site is, what it looks like, where he is, and stuff like that. I also give the exact latitude and longitude because that comes up in some of the NASA scenes. So JPL pointed a satellite in the real world. JPL pointed a satellite at that location wow. and said like, here is the exact location of like Mars where the Ares 3 landing site is wow. at, with a resolution of like one pixel equals one foot, right? And it doesn't look anything like Mars. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> really? Going out of their way Nothing to Nothing better to do? <laughs> oh, it was awesome, though, to, to have that. Was, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you do have a lot of detail, obviously, in all of your settings. Love it. Do you picture things when you write? So the answer is no, and this kind of surprises everybody. I don't have a very visual imagination. Mm. I, I, I'm good at imagining, I think, good at imagining concepts and ideas and this and that and the other thing. And so problems and solutions and all that stuff like that. But in my mind, when I'm conjuring up an image of what's going on, the people are kind of blobs. The the rooms are kind of nondescript. It's not, I. they say that people have this, there's a range of how people's inner, inner movie theater works. Mm -hmm. And some people have it very, very crisp. Like you see every little detail in your imagination and other people see like nothing at all, like mm -hmm. no Bob. And I, not all the way to the nothing at all side, but like I'm kind of toward that side. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have that much of a visual imagination. Like at the end of writing Project Hail Mary, if you ask me, what does Ry you know, Ryland look like? I'd be like, I don't know. And then, you know, if you ask what did Rocky look like, I'm like, well, I know that he's like got a Rocky carapace and he's pentagonally symmetrical, but I didn't have a firm image in my mind of what anything looked like, what the lab looked like, what Rocky's ship looked like, nothing. I had a vague notion of what the Hail Mary itself looked like mm. because I designed it. I wanted to design it to like work. And so I've got this rudimentary drawing of it at the beginning of the book. Mm. Um, but yeah, so the the answer to your question is no, I really don't get anything. So then what's cool is when like in The Martian, they made a movie out of my book and now PHM, it's like that then becomes the correct answer mm -hmm. in my head. Yeah. So people say, what, what do you, you know, what do you think Ryan Grace looks like? I'm like, looks like Ryan Gosling <laughs> because I've seen cuts of the film now. I've seen entire, you know, revs of the film as they go by because I'm a producer on the film. And I'm like, okay, that that's Ryan Grace. And now my head has like retrofitted him. It's like, boop. Okay, that is what Ryland Grace does and has always looked like. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Just supersedes entirely anything well, you had in your brain before. But I didn't have anything in my brain right. before. Okay. So it's just like assigned it, <laughs> you know? <laughs>